I was supposed to do something serious like talking about reading. I get to do something that's not too serious on Friday afternoon. Because, um, the, well, I can't tell you the story anymore because I was here, right? So that's, just, that's one story less. <laughs> it's one story less you'd have to hear. But I'll try to speak it in some way um, before the day is done because Kit is here. And, you know, part of my life in the media is sandwiched between kids and children who pay attention to the radio. Neither of them knows what I'm talking about, but that's okay. So, I'd like to now invite Mr. Al Pike, who is head of the Department of Language and Political Studies at the University of Ghana, to talk to us a little bit about reading. Sorry, I, I find it very difficult to speak with this. Uh, so I hope I hope um, you don't mind and, and you don't feel threatened and in danger. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, I'm very sorry that I was walking in, but um, today I have a series of university meetings which clash with this event. But I, I could not not come here and fulfill this commitment. And so I have to do some juggling to, to find the time to come here and then get back. And then get back for the for those meetings. So I hope you will hope you will forgive me. Um, I was asked to talk about reading and um, I thought that this is a book lounge. And if this is a book lounge, then reading is obviously a very important thought, a very important concept, and a very important necessity when you're talking about a book lounge. Because a book lounge, of course, is about books. You are putting a book out there in the world, and if you go to the trouble, if you go to the trouble of producing that book, and it is trouble, it takes a lot to produce a book. And if you go to that trouble to produce the book, you are doing it based upon a number of assumptions. The first assumption is that there are readers, that there are people who will read it. And the, the, the assumption that, that people will read the book is a problem. Now, why is it a problem? It's a problem for a number of reasons. And the first is another assumption. Now, when people talk about reading today, people talk about reading today in this current time, in this current society, this particular juncture of the world development, there is a widespread belief and a widespread view that people don't read anymore. And they say people don't read anymore, people don't read. And particularly when you're talking about the third world society, that assumption is put forward with, with even greater strength. Because the assumption is that, of course, people in the developed world will read more than those in the third world. And that is an assumption. And it's an assumption that calls for a lot of examination and might not be totally accurate. Take at face value and just put aside like that, that people don't read anymore. And people in the started world, in the Caribbean, people don't read in the Caribbean, people don't read in Guyana. So you're not going to find the readers in there, and so on. And um, that is a generalization. It's a generalization because it's, um, it's a little hasty to just say that and leave it like that. Because that 
that is also based on a further, it also based on a further assumption. And that further assumption is that there is something deficient about the Guyanese society. There is something deficient about the Caribbean society and the third world society. That people in this part of the world don't read anymore, they don't read. And going alongside the assumption that people read in the developed world. Now, the and uh, that something is wrong with the society and its people, and it is a less educated society. The, 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 it is a less educated society because people don't read, and because people don't read, it becomes a less educated society. And all those assumptions are made when one is considering reading, and when one is talking about reading at this time in this part of the world. Now, what are the facts? How, you know, those assumptions are, I know that the discipline of economics. Economics is based on a number of assumptions. Some of them scientific assumptions, but a number of them assumptions based on behavior, on the behavior of people. And even in economics, they tell you that there are, there are constants. There are things that are constants, and there are things that are not constants, that are variables, they vary. And the behavior of people is a failure. The behavior of people is not a constant. And what, therefore, are, how, how truthful then are these assumptions? How much can we hold these assumptions? Now let's look, first of all, and I will use for this the example, the example of the Guyana Prize, the Guyana Prize for the Teacher. No, we used to have um, we used to have something in this country at one time called the Guyana Prize for Literature. And um, when when we used to have it, at the time when I first became associated with it, I first became the secretary of it. And a particular book won the prize, and this was a, a big book, good book, a book to well known across the world. And when it was announced that this book had won the prize. Um, the, well, it, well, it wasn't announced yet because we have to go to some stage. And one, and one thing that we had to do, we had to tell the publishers long before the public announcement was made, we had to tell the publishers that, well, look, the book that you entered won the prize, we had to tell them. And they were very happy and they sent back to say, okay, good, good, good. So when is the announcement? And they said, the announcement will, will be made on some sort of thing. I said, okay then. How many copies of the book shall we send down to the end? <laughs> and right away I started feeling embarrassed. Now why was I embarrassed? Was I embarrassed because guys don't read? Um, the, 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 so on. Because here, here was a big publisher, Faber, Faber and Faber of London. They said, how many copies of this book shall we send down? Because of course, when a book wins the Booker Prize, I love to tell you what is going to happen. And the publishers did it. So they sent a guy to, to, to ask that question, expecting to hear, okay, send about, send about 12 dozens, or send about, about um, you know, uh, send 2,000 copies. And they expect, of course, that the Cody Book Winning Prize it will sell. The Cody Book Winning Prize it will sell. And therefore, they're going to send their copies down to their hand. And, uh, I felt a little embarrassed because I could not tell them, oh man, send 5,000 copies or something like that. I wouldn't tell you what I told them, but that day, the embarrassment was there. And why was there this embarrassment? Why was I a little, a little um, brought, brought to ground by this? It is because there are small numbers of readers in there. Not so much. I'm not going to join the assumption that people don't read, that guys don't read. It has, but there are small numbers of readers. It has to do with numbers. That's the first factor. One factor has to do with numbers. Why is it that the Caribbean's best writers through history, throughout history, from the time of the big rush, 
since they've been brushed in 1948, 1950s and so on, Caribbean writers have been migrating in order to be professional writers. They went to England because they couldn't remain in the Caribbean and be professional writers. They couldn't write and sell their books. They couldn't get an audience, a large audience, because of the small population of the place. So the first factor is the population, the size of the population. When you're, when you're a publisher, the size of the population matters. It has something to do with what you're doing because of that. And there are small numbers of readers in Guyana, which would make it a publisher's problem. People complain all the time that there are no publishing houses in the Caribbean. And the publishing houses don't exist in the Caribbean. And one of the reasons why publishing houses don't flourish, they don't flourish, and it's not that they, they have never been any so they don't flourish. It's the numbers of readers. It's not so economical to print all these books for people to read. And that is a factor. The numbers of readers. The populations are small. And then when you go further along in Caribbean societies, you have other factors which are historical, which are sociological, and so on. The Caribbean society, a, a post-colonial society like Diana like, 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 and so on, would have a small percentage of the population who are highly educated, a small percentage of the population. They, they, if you go and see what percentage of Guyanese, the Guyanese, the Guyanese has a population of, well, uh, uh, I'm talking about those who live in Guyana. Last count I heard was seven, what, um, 775,000 people who still, still live in Guyana. Don't know me on that figure. What percentage of those people are educated in a sense that they have gone through university, they, they have a university qualification? Think about what percentage. And I'm sure that the percentage that is going to come to you is, is going to be larger than the reality, than, than, than what really exists. What percentage of them are have a secondary education? What percentage of them are readers? What percentage of those people would read? And the, 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 the people who would read, there are those who read out of necessity. They read because they have to read because of what they are doing, their, their, their profession, and, and, and so on. They have to read in order to maintain the profession, in order to work, in order to practice, and so on. And then you have those who read as a habit. They read as a habit because they like it, they got it there, they recognize its value, and because they read for, well, okay, people who like reading, and therefore they will read. There are those who read for, for entertainment. Those who read for entertainment. And then you have a larger, a kind of a larger number of people there. So when you put all those people together, you have a reading population. But when you measure it against the total population, it's going to be a percentage. It's not going to be the bulk of the people in that, the, 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 the great majority, and so on. It's going to be the it's, it's, it's going to, so therefore numbers there are there. It's, the next factor is time. And as I, as I mentioned, time, I'm going, to, I'm, going, I'm going to start to hurry through this because I don't even know how much time I have. I'm sure it's not already. Um, but there is time. And the time I'm talking about is that at one time, reading was the only means of education that people had. Reading was the only means of education. You had to read in order to be educated, in order to learn things and to get knowledge and to get information you had to you, you had to read. And the <clears throat> or you had to sit at the feet, to sit at the feet of, of a tutor. And that, that, that was the, the the means of education in ancient times, in ancient Greece, in ancient Greece for example, where the, the, the educated men sat at the feet of their tutors, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and so on, like that. And you know, you, you, you literally sat at his feet and learned and learned from him. Um, now and then for you read, you read to get to get knowledge and information. 
There used to be a, there used to be a saying that people talk about, you are reading for a degree. You go to university and you're reading for a degree. And the term came into general research. People would say, what are you reading? And say, I'm not university. What are you reading? You know, and that term would come into that term. Because you had to read to get that degree, and you have to do a lot of reading. Things have changed a little bit now in the universities. The universities have changed, and the way the methods of imparting knowledge and so on have diversified and have extended. And so reading has now become a little less on the scale of things, even, even at universities. And there are other ways of obtaining knowledge. And they, everybody is a little less dependent on books, a little less dependent on reading and on books than they used to be at one time. And, they, 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 and, and therefore that is another factor when you're talking about reading and why people read or why people do not. Then there is the other factor which is reading for pleasure. People read for pleasure, to be entertained. And we find that if, 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 if we look at the 21st century, there are several other competing means of entertainment. Several other competing means of entertainment apart from reading. And so people will turn to these other methods of reading, but they are more immediate, they are quicker. They are faster, more immediate, and in, in, perhaps in the eyes of some, more exciting and, and, uh, and, and, and more interesting. So that reading becomes a little less on the scale again when you, when you look, at, look at people reading for entertainment and what they have available to them today and the, and the, and, 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 uh, the competitors, the competitors that now exist um, for reading and for reading books. So they, you publish your book, and your book has to compete with all kinds of other things people who, who want to read it. Now, technology is another factor, of course. Technology is responsible for many of these competing, uh, competing uh, ways of, of, of entertainment. And so reading keeps going down on the scale as you look across all these various other factors and, and, uh, and, and competitive. A very popular term nowadays is, um, is what if somebody asks you, what is X, Y, and Z? You say, oh, I don't know, all right, hold on, hold on, I go Google it. Mm -hmm. And you go and Google it. Um, so people will Google it, rather than pick up a book or go to the library or go somewhere where they have to read in order to get the information, in order to get the, 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 the facts, and so on. And so you have, again, other means. The whole world of knowledge, the whole world of knowledge is available to people. And if, and you click on a mouse, and you turn on your computer, you don't even have to go as far as your computer. All you have to do, you can put phone. Pick up your phone. And you have right there in your hand, your phone, with access to a wide range of knowledge, a wide range of, of, of information. You're talking to somebody, and you mention something that they don't know about, and within five minutes they will tell you, they will pick up the phone and they will Google it. So reading, therefore, has competitors, and reading has been dwindling, and we talk about, about all these ways in which reading has been dwindling on the scale of things, and the, they, 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 they both things. So therefore, we, we have to do away with that assumption, even though it is not entirely untrue about people not reading, people not reading. It is true that you have people who don't read. It is true that, that perhaps when you go across in society, you're going to find many people who don't think about reading. They, 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 wouldn't, they wouldn't like it. And they don't do it, they don't think of it. It's a part of their habit. They have no habit of reading and reading. Yes. They exist. But don't use that. Don't use that as the answer to everything. And you say that well, and then and particularly you talk about it and the fact that people don't read anymore, people don't read and read. All of those things are are, are are important. Now um finally I will refer to something that happened in two thousand and eight. 
2018, I had a curry festa. And um, at curry festa, when I was the chairman of one of the important symposia, an important symposia that took place there, and one of the most memorable sessions in, that, in, in, in those symposia was a session with Derek Walcott, the great Derek Walcott, as the, as the name of the guest. And the president, Jack Dale, was there, and they both spoke. And a debate, a debate developed between the two of them over the what I did and said, OK, what do you do with $20 million? Do you build a road, or do you build a theater? Derek Walcott was plugging and saying, no, no, of course, you have to build a theater. You have to build so and so and so and so on. And President Jack Dale was saying, well, of course, of course, I have to build a road. I have my people, I have these things to think about, and so on and so on. They were a quite an interesting de de debate that, de that developed. But I'm quite sure that, that both of those gentlemen knew that they had an audience who liked to hear the debate that was going on, but they knew it. I'm sure they knew that, that it was not one or the other. It wasn't one or the other. That either you build a road or you build a theater. And that they both have their places and their functions and their uses and you build both. And you, and, and you have to find a way of doing both to, in order to sustain your population. Um, the, 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 and, and, and that is the, is the case. And I just give another example. And I have to go back to the Guyana Prize to give you another example. Because just recently, just recently, I was saying that, well, look, you know, the Guyana Prize does not have to remain a thing of the past. We can bring it back. Why not? We can bring it back. Let me see whether I can write to the government and ask the government, can you please bring back the Guyana Prize? I mean, I hesitated a little bit and said, let me wait, a, let, me, let me wait a month or two. Give them a chance to settle down and the pandemic well, was upon us. You had the, the, the pandemic was upon us. You had the great floods, flood, flooding taking place all across the country. And the president must be a very worried man. How do I deal with all this flooding and so on? So let me not go and ask him right away about the enterprise because he's is preoccupied. However, the, the thing is, again, I come back to one or the other, and it's not one or the other, it's sports. So you take care of the flood, you take care of the pandemic, but you still have to take care of such things as the guy in Prize. I don't have time to go into the great details of it and why these things are so important, but I'm sure you know understand that I don't even have to tell you that you still have to take care of folks. Now, what would you give to somebody? Would you give them a book or would you give them the cathode ray tube? The cathode ray tube, many years ago, was the most important ingredient responsible for television. And so if they, what, you, what is more important, a book? Today, you would ask the question, what is more important, a book or a computer? Do you give somebody a computer or do you give them a book? And you think about it and say, you know, which do you prefer? Just, just remember that the, the computer would, would never exist if books did not exist. The Catwell Ray 2 would never have been developed if books did not exist. There is still a place for books in the society. There is still a place for reading in this society. So that reading is a little bit more of a complex issue than you might think, but I'm sure you understand that reading remains extremely important, even in today's complex society of high technology and all the different things that are going on which might compete, which might compete with books. Which might work. Reading can never be brushed aside. Reading is going to remain paramount, it's going to remain important, even in the face of all these other things that I have been, I have been talking about. Thank you very much.
much, Al. And this might be a good point for me to mention that the books being launched today would be available on Amazon, including the Amazon Kindle version. So we don't have the problem that Al spoke about. We didn't ask the publishers how many copies, or how many copies they should send. We just thought we'd skip the question and ensure that you could get these books on Amazon. And most readers today uh, at least have, again, alluding to what Alice said, a Kindle app, so you can get them. The first one, well, the big one, as the uh, right to call is already available on Amazon if you want to pick up a physical copy of Barnes & Noble, and the other one will be available. So we'll get to that, but I just thought I'd jump in now, because I was making those very, very valuable contributions to um, the discourse that we're reading. And it's interesting, too, that you talk had someone talk about reading before you try to go with the book. That's a very clever way. And thanks, Al. I'd now like to invite Lloyd and Kevin to play a trumpet and flute solo for us before we move to the next speaker. Lloyd and Kevin.
Andrew Lloyd and Kevin, and that medley, ending with a patriotic song we all know so well. If you didn't recognize it, the first song in that medley is from an old Christian hymn that's titled Blessed Assurance. And this is my story, this is my song, is the refrain of that hymn, and it's the title of one of our books being launched today, My Story and My Song. We are now moving to the next speaker, His Excellency Norman Ramatar, former President of the Republic. Please have a welcome. Thank you very much, Master Senator Bernice. Come in, Mrs. Rui. Congratulations. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends of all. I'm very happy to have been given this opportunity to say a few words about the author, who is a comrade and a friend. And I wish once more to congratulate him for writing these books, his autobiography. Why is it important? Why is it so very important that he has done this? Many people I know in this country, distinguished people, many that I've known and worked with in the People's Progressive Party, who had a tremendous amount of knowledge and information, experience, have less left us, and they have taken all of that with them, and they were not able to share as much as was, I believe, necessary. People that I've met and learned from, people like Boyd Ram Karan, Brindley Ben, E.R. Jacob, Cedric Borden Nunes, Ram Savoy, Ripu Deman Prasad, E.M.G. Wilson, Pariyak Sukai, and more recently, Kamal Feroz Mohammed, Komal Chan, and Cyril Belgrade. All of these people who are engaged and involved in very important struggle. They have not left many of the mentor Guyanese to understand what they have, what took place, that the insight that they have. Perus, for instance, was one of the, was the only person who was with Dr. Jagan and Raji Chalitin when they fell out because of political differences. And that, I think, would have been a good story to tell. There are other comrades who wrote a lot. Shelly Jagan, for instance, we were fortunate that he was a great communicator. And he wrote, he spoke, and managed to find communication. Ashton Chase is another such person. And Janet Jagan also wrote quite a bit. But many of them also wrote on specific top topics and not giving us some of the insight that we get from the Western trial and other such works. And I believe what we will get from Clement's book. So I'm very happy that Clement took the time and made the effort to write memoirs and to fill that void. And why is that important? Because Clement's life itself encompasses a very important period in the history of the country. And he was not just a bystander. He was a full participant in many of the struggles that took place in Guyana. He came into the struggle at a time when it was very, very, very difficult to be a member of the team. Came into the party after the party left government in 1964. And when things were tough, 
and it was, I will say, repressive. It was repressive from 1964. Many people don't talk about the fact that Guyana is practically the only country in the Commonwealth that got its independence with a state of emergency in place. The political prisoners, CB Noons, and several other persons in place. So from the very beginning of our independence, we were already struck with a kind of dictatorship and political problems. And that is the period of time when Clement came into the movement. He was born in 1950, the same year that he was born. And he is very much a self-made man. The PDP was for Clement was not just a political organization and an instrument to carry on political struggle and work. But for him, it was a university. He developed very strong academically. Of course, he had the tendency to want to inquire and to learn and to move ahead. And his biography that he will write, the autobiography, is a kind of a biography for many of us who shared those times with him and those struggles with him. He came from humble beginnings, but like many of us, was fired by the ideas and the vision of the DVD and fired by Comercelli Chagan in particular. The party for Clement was, as I said, more than just an organization for struggle. The education was acquired in the heat of struggle, in the moments of struggle. It wasn't a time when you went and studied one side and then come to the struggle the next time. It all happened simultaneously. He began as a good soldier and has reached the stage of a general. I have known him almost for most, if not all, of this period of time in the party. We both joined around the same time, 1967, 1968. I say we joined in 1967, 1968, because when, that is my experience, but I'm sure it's his, when I went to join the party in 1967, I was too young to be a member of the party. I was just 17. And to be a member of the party, you had to be 18. And they gave us, at that time, the PYO was being reorganized after the 1964, when the PYO was practically become most of the Bagwan period. And then they gave me a PDP card that was a PYO stamp. And then eventually, when I became 18, I moved into the party. And that same thing, I think, happened with Clement. And that means that our total adult life was spent in this party and in the struggle for freedom and democracy. I knew I have known him always to be a hard worker and took his assignments very, very seriously. He studied a lot and he read widely. The two of us were opposite in some respect. Clement was all this extremely neat. He obviously to the desk and he was walking extremely neat, got everything done. I, on the other hand, couldn't seem to keep my desk clean. He worked first in the mirror as a technician little type operator. And then he moved into journalism. And the way he moved into journalism was very interesting as well. He approached Mrs. Jagan and 
that he wanted to write. And she gave him the, 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 the entrance fee to go to the cinema. I think it was no, uh, to go and see a film and say, write a review of this film for the era. And that is how he started his writing career. From that, that period of time, but today, bring it out, today we are launching two books by Kenneth Toei, and that is the beginning, that is his beginning. He also, he also, how did he meet Chetty Jagan first? How did he meet him? He was working at a store, and he bought his father's store. Degu, not Degu, am I right? Degu store. And Jenny went there to get, Jenny was living at that time in, um, in Camp Street. And he went to buy some mirror there. And there he met Clement. And they had some conversations. And he invited Clement to come to Freedom House. So after Clement must have been fresh to him and he came to him to tell me to come to Freedom House and learn something. And that was a great choice that he made then. Some of the political activities that we went through, as I said, we were not just bystanders, we participated in the 1968 election, first one of the massive we break, the 1970 local government election, another election that was very, very important. 1973 general election was very, very tense in our country. The 1977 referendum, and he and I had a peculiar joint experience in that referendum. Together with a comrade by the name of George Lee, who is somewhere in the United States right now, and Harry the right now, what? We were chased by the GBL all over this, this Georgetown. And we barely managed to make it back to Freedom House before they could catch us. What was our crime? We were taking out photographs of the empty polling booths and we took out a photograph of the military on the road. And that was a big offense. The 1980 elections were very difficult to come in. What was here for the poll period? He came in for the election because by then the party had sent him to Prague to represent the party on the editorial council of World Marxist Review. But he came back. But he missed in that period some extremely important discussions that we had. The decision that the GPP had to make was whether we should contest the 1980 grant. Grant was part of that decision. Whether we should contest the 1980 elections or whether we should boycott that third election. And we had two days of debates. Two long days of debates. And that is one of the memory that I have of Chelly Jagger. Because when the meetings and his power of persuasion, because when the meetings started, he was in a minority. He was saying that we had to contest those elections. And very important leaders of the party, including his own wife, were saying that we should not contest those elections. But he argued like a giant in those two days. And, and remember, I remember at the end when he had the majority with him, with him, I remember one question asked of him, he said, well, what are you going to tell people? In 1968, we know you have to contest. In 1973, yes, I think you have to contest. Well, what are you going to tell them now? And then you see the self-confidence of the man when he said, I will tell them the truth. I will tell them the truth. I can tell them the truth. And that we have to contest these elections. That 
Parliament for us is not a place we're only going to collect salary. Parliament must be an instrument of struggle for what we want. So all of these elections were education for us. Thank you very much. Why was he here? Because I, was, I had replaced him in the track, and he didn't do the same thing that I did with him. So I think it's in the year that I get back here. And 1992, that, you know, that, you know, everyone here knows about that. And the 1990, but those were not the only type of struggles that we had. In between, there were tremendous struggles that Clement played a very, very big role in them. We had 1974. 1974, we had a big struggle there as well. Uh, and that was the time when the University of Guyana had banned the people who brought me from coming back home. And that was when, for the first time, all of forces began to join the GDP in their struggle. And Clement was in the house doing a lot of organization and helping. Forced joint meeting of the opposition forces was massively crushed at the corner of Cummings and Mill Street. Um, but that was the beginning of a more united opposition against the PNC regime. Then we had the 1975 and 1976 sugar strikes. That were epic. The 1975 strike on International Women's Day, on International Women's Year, women, one name Halima comes to my mind, was brutally beaten in the game field on the east bank of the Barara. 1977, another massive strike in the sugar industry that was for what I would call industrial democracy. Where the union had an agreement with the cooperation and they did not, they changed their position because the PNC government moved away from the $14 a day. And Clement was there in all of those struggles at every stage he was fighting. And in the election struggle, he worked in the elections commission at a difficult time. When you had others as the chairman of the election, of the elections commission, the Arnold Rampasad struggle in 1978, and we had a lot of international work. I remember Clement organized uh, one that well, was Wilson, EMG Wilson, and then organized a coffin that you were pulling up the main street to protest the fight in Vietnam, the war in Vietnam. I recall the amount of demonstrations we had in front of the parliament building to try to force the PNC government to recognize the People's Republic of China as a legitimate, legitimate representative of the people of China. I remember the struggle and what he did in organizing and helping us in Angela Davis demonstration for Angela Davis and for Cuba. He was also head of the Guyana Cuba Friendship Society and was very active in many of the other friendship societies in, in our country. So he will have a lot to say and that is why the book looks so fun. Mm -hmm. I think he did. He put a lot of stuff in there. My friends, 19, I will just first quickly go back a, a, a minute later for some of the some of the struggles that we had that were massively broken up and that are forgotten in our history. I think in 1969 versus 1970, when Clyde Thomas was also banned, like Rodney, was banned from Jamaica. And another big demonstration we had at a big public meeting at 
add um, what you call a dependent factor. And that beating was savagely broken up. Shelly Jagged himself was injured in the, with the truck. He had a big cut on his chest. And many of us, because we tried to protect him, we had a lot of fighters. My friends, in 1992, you know, Kennedy became our first foreign minister of the GDP city government. And he discharged that position with distinction. During his time in the GDP, he developed a love for foreign policy. And maybe when he went to Prague, that even concretized some of his position more and more. And then he was Minister of Trade, and you see them here, with all the positions that he held. And all the positions that he held, he held with distinction. And there were very few ministers that were attacked as he was. He, he still remembers, he still reminds me that when I was president and told him that I want him to continue as Minister of Home Affairs, he still reminds me that I told him as a boy, I know that this is probably one of the toughest jobs in the government. I probably am giving you a basket to fetch water. And that was but uh, and then you know he, he made a lot of personal attacks he had to endure, but he stuck to his position and he made the way. I'd like to speak to say, not to talk a little bit about some of his personality traits. I already spoke about how hard working he was. I'll give you one example. I remember one, I think it was 1976, we had a party congress in Borbis. That time they didn't have the bridge, we had to go over the ferry. And you know, working with Shelly was a pleasure in some ways, very nice, but some ways it was difficult. Because particularly he was writing things and you had to print them, because he would want to change very regularly. And myself and Clement were left alone one night as he finished all his cleaning up that he had to do. And we worked whole night on a guest no machine, printing out the Central Committee report to get it to Borbis in time. I remember I managed to reach Borbis, but I didn't hear a single word from speech. I dropped the sleep immediately at that time. He, was all, he also has some Negative traits too, you know. I never see sometimes man like Clement Roy, moody. But he was also very emotional. And I remember one incident in particular. I had just gone to Prague to take over from him. And it was at that same time, it was he who informed me that Maurice Bishop was assassinated. And in telling me that, he was actually bawling on the telephone, crying out loud of what had happened to Boris Bishop. I think it's largely because of the fact that we in the PVP had become very close to Boris because he came here to defend Arnold Ramasad and we had been working with him. And also because Clement spent some time with him immediately after the revolution, he was the first PVP man and probably one of the first Caribbean men to get in there after the revolution. He's also sometimes being a very serious, serious man. And that has a little bit of contradiction. Because when we were young, he would even had the reputation of being a little bit of a ladies' man. <laughs> and I used to wonder what is it that this man has that girls will like him. He moody, he serious, and a handsome dog with me in the inside. <laughs> but he, he had had that. He was a. Uh, he also has a very good ear for language. He speaks Spanish fluently. He speaks. He's competent in Russian and in Czech. And that has helped him. 
So in conclusion, comrades, the book therefore, I think, promises to be educational, entertaining, and I think it will it will be a uh, accumulation of experiences unique in many, many ways for Guyanese of today to have an opportunity to read. And I therefore, although I haven't had the chance to read the book, I know the man and I know that it will be a good read. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Back through some, some rocky stories. I'm going to give a little abbreviated version of my little rocky story. Because um, the rocky meeting, the first meeting I had with Rocky face to face was actually a confrontation. It was leading up to the 1992 election. When I was working in state media, which at the time meant something. I ended my state media days working as kids. Um, when I worked at GTV, a job that you graciously allowed me to have, and I'm so grateful to today. But I have been um, trying as much as possible to give coverage to the PPP, even though it wasn't the thing to do on state media. And so I uh, called up the step of Freedom House to get an interview. And because I was state media, the assumption was that I was a spy and a bad person. And so Rohi confronted me. The worst of the story I usually tell when he's not around is that he tossed me down the stairs bodily. But I, they told me at home that I can't tell that portion because people might not understand it, thinking it was a violent, ugly man, which is not the case. But I um, was in a confrontation <laughs> made me feel like I was being kicked down the stairs. But um, we've, had, we've had some great times of working ever since then I have just the utmost respect for the um, And those were difficult days. Not like the days you described, but that, those days had its own degree and level of difficulty. Anyway, we're going to invite the Kimberly and Shalita dance group to entertain us now. <coughs>
Many thanks to the Kimberly Street Dance Group. And now I'd like to invite the Honorable Rob Rampere to introduce the author. Thank you, Master Ceremonies. Uh, from Rohi, this is Rohi. Uh, from President Don Ramata, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think I'm at a safe enough distance from you, so you won't infect me. So I can speak without my mouth. Um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to congratulate Clement momentous occasion. It's momentous because it is the only political biography of a serious politician published in Guyana since the Western Trial. And that's a great achievement. I have talking about reading, I am usually engaged with a book all the time, and I just finished a 670-page book, which I promised I will never read a book of that length at my age anymore. And here I'm confronted with a 570-page book, um, which I have to start, which I have now uh, time to start. So the first thing I need to do is to congratulate the writer. I can't introduce him, which is the topic that I will ask to speak on, because there is nothing more to say after Donald's speech. <laughs> there's nothing to introduce him on, there's nothing to say about him. And there is a very nice introduction of him at the back of your program, which is also at the back of the book. It's extracted from the back of the book, and it's at the back of the program. So I don't think you need any further introduction from me. But what I can say is that up to 2015, when Clement admitted office after the last elections, it had been about 40 years from about, from about the mid-70s. So it was a full 40 years that he spent in the leadership of the PVP and the leadership of the government. So that all the events that took place at that time were events where he played an important or central role. Donald spoke of all those events. And why it is important is that this book captured a great many of them, a nice, well-written prose, nice bite-sized uh, chapters that are easily readable. And Clement has had a lot of experience in writing, so he's aware of what he's doing. So the book is highly recommended. And why it is important is because the failure of our leaders to write has cost us a great deal. You know, my father quarrels frequently with Jenny. And in one quarrel, he told him that you didn't bring me in politics. I don't owe you anything. So you would find that very strange. And I found it very strange too. But what did it, what was he saying? He was saying that he was introduced to politics by a man named Frank Van Sortimont. And that leads to an entire history of the Transport Workers Union, the formation of that union, who played roles in that union. My father was an executive member of the Transport Workers Union before he joined the Political Affairs Committee in 1947. Polydor was the general secretary. It always bothered me over the years in the 70s that he was so friendly with Polydor. And my father
far enough of told me these things. He had always been so friendly with Polydor and uh, it, it, it was something that was strange to me until I learned that he served on the Polydor in the 1940s, prior to 1947, in the executive committee of the Transport Workers Union, all our histories are punished. The Transport Workers Union had a tear strike in 1948, early 48, same year of the Enmore en Martyrs event, and laid the foundation. The PUP wasn't involved in that strike, but it laid, well, for the PUP was formed, but laid the foundation for the militancy of workers on the Chevrolet Estate. And the Transport Workers Union played an important role in supporting that strike. Now the, the, the union, the papers have all been destroyed in a fire. So all of that history is gone and there's nobody in existence who can write it. And that is what we lose when we do not write. And that is what, conversely, what we have gained by Clement writing his autobiography. It doesn't matter what his views are, it doesn't matter what, whether you agree or disagree with the views or whether you agree or disagree with the interpretation which is placed here. It is his interpretation. And when historians come to write and analyze the events of the era that Clement has written about, his views would be considered and would assume a great deal of importance. I have a friend who is a close relative of Abraham Simurai. And one day, about two decades ago, he was telling me, in the presence of my father, he was complaining about the PPP's behavior towards Abraham Simurai. That Bahram had gone up to a meeting on the East Coast, somewhere on the East Coast, and he had this meeting of party people. And, um, well, in Bahram's days, you could do that. You could independently organize a meeting of party members. In my day, you couldn't do that. By the time you arrived there, party members would disappear somehow. But Bahram had this meeting, and the PMP sent its thoughts to break up the meeting. My father said, I was at that meeting. I was the person who was sent by the PPP. And all I did was went, was go and sit at the head table, uninvited of course. And the meeting broke up naturally. I didn't. Nobody is there to write that story. When the when the event at the Congress was over where Baron Singh Rai had challenged Prindy Ben for the chairmanship of the party and lost. Cherry sent my father to Baram's house in Kingston to talk to him to see if they can find some way to lessen the animosity which had been created by this event. But my father knocked at the door several times. Balram did not emerge. And there's nobody to write about that. Balram Simrai left Guyana in great bitterness and found them to come back or to have any Guyanese friends or have any contact with any Guyanese. He told that to David the Kearns, who he met accidentally in the streets of London. And David the Kearns spoke about it publicly. I can't remember where. Now, there's a book written about Baron Simurai against the green. But if Balram Singh Rai had told his story, we would have got some first-hand information. You remember out of that event came the statement by Fenton Ramsoy, 
that if he, he works in mysterious ways, a uh, famous statement probably um, popularized by kids. <laughs> so, Ross High Guy and have written anything. Spoke a lot, he hasn't written anything. Now, that is why this event is so important. That all of us must write our experiences for the people of Guyana, for the history of Guyana. When I was in the Elections Commission, I took over from it in 1994. The insults he had to endure, what suffered from the PDP was, I don't think it was written in the book, but the insults he had to endure were awful, not only at that time, but I mean, father used to call him a sneak. Openly, oh, he did. A snake, a rat, a dog from a wise tongue, all that. Language, actual language like that. I was in the Elections Commission in 1973, and my chairman was Sir Donald Jackson, and my the member of the team was Sir Lionel Lock. So I had a much easier time for that didn't stop the elections for being um, rigged. And I did the same thing at Clarem Blue. And as soon as the meeting was finished, call a press conference and see what happened, state your position. So I uh, believe that Clement has done this country of great service and we should all be grateful to him. Now, the, the, Chen Chakra was a great a figure of the Caribbean of great importance, so important. But, and books have been written by Palmer, by the Texan the professor from Texas, one or two other people. Um, Professor Clem C. Duran has written about Chetty Jaden, not in, in his book, Sweeping Bitter Sugar, not in the same vein as, um, as Palmer and others. Uh, he took an ideological position, a position that is, that is shared by many people, but, but with great, with great, with great, uh, great the use of multiple invectives. Um, but nothing has been written about Borno, even though if the speeches were published in Destiny the Mold, but nothing has been written about him. A man that Clem C. Geran a description of Barnum that Clem C. Turan adopted. He didn't use the words in quotation, he adopted it. A man of nimbleness of intellect. Nobody has written about Barnum. Who is a very important figure in, in the history of Bayan and in the history of the region? There Positives, the recognition of China, some foreign policy issues at the time were considered very progressive. Maneuvered a bit, changed, but at the end of the day, there were positions which were supported by the PPP. The economic policies, the establishment of CARICOM, of CARIFTA. So there are many positives that are available to be written about. But nobody of Barnum's era has written any autobiography or nobody of Barnum's 
era has written a biography, or nobody since has seen it necessary to write the biography. Norman Manley wrote, um, Michael Manley wrote his autobiography, published it, I'm read it, it's there. So that is what we need in Guyana. Now, I would like to commend the author. I think enough has been said by Donald, about which I cannot approve. Um, I'd like to commend him for this effort. I know that um, some of us have been pressured by others to do our own work. I can't get beyond page two, so I've been trying for more than a year. So um, I know how difficult it is. And of course, it also depends on what you want to write and how you want to present it. Um, Clement has been successful in presenting life, his politics, and his work in government. That's a big task which he has achieved so far. And I commend the book to you. I've already got my copy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ram Brand. We're going to be, just before we hear from the author today, we're going to be Entertained by the Kennedy Dance
that is the entry for the material. It seems as if this was what Naman Kamata was talking about. <laughs> and that's all I could think about when I was watching the Easy of Ladies Dance before Pepe Go. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming here this afternoon. I know you all have your individual programs, you're all very busy people, but you took the time to come to a joint with me at this, what I consider to be a modest activity to promote a work or two pieces of work that I managed to complete. Mainly throughout the COVID pandemic period, which is still ongoing. But I took the opportunity to sit and write just on the eve of the outbreak of the COVID pandemic and with the restrictions that gave me the opportunity to continue writing. While I was writing the book, at the same time, I was writing letters to the editor of the newspapers, mainly the Stafford News and the Venture News. I've had some very bad experiences with the Guyana Times and with the Grammar. And I took a personal decision not to send any of my letters to those two newspapers. Because, like so many writers, you put a lot of effort intellectually into writing. You do research, you talk to people, you gain insights, and plus you take the time to put your thoughts down on paper and dispatch it, thinking that the editor would try to see the letter through the eyes of the writer. But as you know, a newspaper has to be sold, and space has to be given to others who may not be as prolific or frequent in their writing like Clement Rohe or GSK Lyon. You probably have been coming across quite often. No comparison whatsoever between you. <laughs> now, the history behind this book is very interesting. I have a cousin, one of many cousins, who live in the United States. She's the daughter of the man that was the first black bishop of Starbuck in Guyana, Bishop Elder, who lived in that house of his red house. I called her and I asked her, her name is Natalie. And I told Natalie that I had an interest in writing a book and I wanted or to suggest a publisher in the United States. Natalie put me on to her pastor. By the way, she's from the Anglican Church. She put me on to her pastor, who at the same time was a publisher. And we had a conversation, myself and this 
gentlemen, and he put me onto the publishing house, which is called Outskirts Press, based in Colorado in the United States. So I had a word with these people, and we, I signed a contract with them to publish the book, give them certain rights, and give myself certain rights as well. And incidentally, those rights eventually blossom into further benefits for an author who's associated with that publishing home because as we speak now, this book is on show with probably thousands of other books at the Hong Kong Big Fear, Book Fear, that is currently going on. And it will be in next, the next month in August on show at the Beijing Book Fair, which is a massive book fair as well. The book is also available at Barnes & Noble, a massive bookstore chain, Kindle, and on Amazon.com. I took the advice of a very good friend not to import any huge amounts of this book. Precisely because of what Mr. Franklin told us earlier. And so this book is very limited amount of copies here in Canada, but it's available on sale at Amazon.com and Kindle. And if any of you happen to be in Beijing next month and you visit the book fair, you can get copies there as well. In fact, the contract that I signed subsequently with this publishing house makes the book available at all international book fairs that will take place around the world. There was a suggestion that I consider having the book translated in other languages, but that's another contractual agreement that will cost a tiny sum of money. But I'm looking forward to some loyalties from the book. And Al is quite correct. From the records which you can which you can observe from the publishers, many of these books are being sold overseas. The majority of books are being sold in other countries, not in Ghana. Some are sold in Ghana, but the bulk are being bought by persons outside of Ghana. And that is precisely why I decided to enter into this contractual arrangement with the publishing house. Because the publishing house facilitates these arrangements to have the book on display at international book fairs around the world. The book, this one I'm referring to, that is my story, my song. As I said, at some point in the book, that never judge a book by its cover. Because the title is really a religious inspired title. My story, my song, comes from a very famous hymn that I like very much based on the words of the hymn. And that's precisely Blessed Assurance. That's the name of the hymn. I took these words from that hymn. My story, my song. This is my story, this is my song. And you heard the Jew play part of that in their rendition. I introduced the book by talking about my roots. Where did the Rohis come from? They have to come from somewhere. And so when you go through the section of the book that deals with my roots, you will see where 
A generation of indentured laborers came to Guyana. And from that generation of indentured laborers came a man and a woman who eventually married multiple times, made two half brothers. One of the brothers married to a woman who came as an indentured laborer and settled in the island of Wakanan. And this woman had married three times before and had three sons with different fathers, different men. Two of the sons eventually came to Georgetown. In those days you had, in those days, in order to get a job, you had to have a baptismal certificate with English five names. One was Ramla Chan and one was Ramlo Chan. One changed his name to R-O-H-E-E. -E. The other one changed his name to R-O-H-Y. But with English, one was John Davidson Rohe, and one was just John Rohe. Two Johns. But the difference was in the English names. And they did that precisely because they wanted to work in the city. Eventually, one got a very good job in the court, and another got a job as a porter at the public hospital. That was my great grandfather. He was a porter at the Johnson Hospital. The other brother, Rohi, he branched out and got a job in the court system. So those of you who are acquainted with the Rohis now would know that there was a set of Rohis who lived somewhere in Atfield Street, middle class, developed into middle class, and the other set of Rohis were just common people. Eventually, my great grandfather became a translator because he knew Hindi and Urdu. And so he was able to translate for persons coming to the hospital to the doctors and the nurses. And interestingly, out of that relationship grew other Rohis. My father. went to England and there he met the daughter of a gentleman by the name of Clement Nicholas who was a bandmaster who went to play music in England. He met an English woman and you know like policemen in those days they always have a woman somewhere. And he impregnated the English woman and bore a child. A girl daughter by the name of Kathleen. He came back to Canada and as a man, as a member of the Canada Police Force Band, and continued playing. He left the daughter over there with the woman. But interestingly, my father eventually went up there and found this girl, was introduced to this girl, and he married her and brought her back again. And that's my generation. Three boys and three girls. And the last of the boys, most of them have gone already. Only one girl is surviving, and I don't know. And so that's the generation, that's where the roots of the story begin. Now you hear the music in the background, why I want to do this. 
to an octave and a quadruple of it. So you get the flavor of the period that I'm talking about. Boyhood days are some of the most enjoyable days that I have in the city. Because I spend most of my life in the city of Brownstone. Roaming all over. And eventually my mother passed away. Six children, 25 years ago. And we continued from there on the family split up. After the family split up, we went different ways. And Donald mentioned that the time that I went to live with, eventually got me a job with National Hardware, which was before Boyer's Furniture Store. Eddie Boyer came back from the UK to take over the business from his dad and build that, what I would call, a mini empire in the hardware business. But National Hardware was just a small store at the beginning, but Edward Boyer grew it to what it is today. The he I worked with in those days where Chelly came, was building his house in Bellier. We met, we had a talk. That was in the height of the Vietnamese War. He invited me to Freedom House to look at films. In those days, they had 16 mm films with a projector to look at film shows. And that's where my political journey began. So, the boyhood days was mainly taken up with family, my brothers and my sisters, roaming the city. And just like boys, as I was telling my friend behind here in the steel band, we went tramping behind steel bands in the city of Georgetown. We went swimming at the groin trying to catch what is called the Paco fish. I almost drowned because, as you know, the tide there and the, 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 what they call the underground currents are very strong. But I managed to survive. And then my mother, of course, as I said, passed away. I'm going to split up because my dad couldn't take care of six children. So he sent each one of us out to deliver the man. And of course, we had a lot of rivers to cross in those days. Now, if I got politically involved and made it with the PPP, up to this day, I still remain a member of the party. Politics have changed a lot. It's not like before, when you speak at street corner meetings or you go house to house. Not only during campaign period, Normally, you go house to house selling party literature, encouraging people to join the party, you know, what people might call old time politics. Now, everything is done by multimedia television, Facebook, things like that. I noticed only recently a submarine cable is now going to the SP or that will revolution. Events on the Eskimo course. So, political practice has changed over the years. And those of us who are regarded as old guards, some of us have managed to adjust to the new times. The cultural performance that you saw here this afternoon is a manifestation of how we were able to adjust and make presentations that are pretty modern. The Rodney era was an era that was extremely important for me at the time when Walter Rodney came back to the end. I remember the massive meetings on board of all, thousands of people coming out. Attempts to break up the meetings, and then eventually the killing of Walter Rodney. When Rodney died, I was not a guy, I was already a willing brother, I don't mention. I wasn't here when he was when he, when he, a 
assassination took place. But there were events that took place before that in which I was deeply involved. Take, for example, Grenada. Donald mentioned Grenada. March 13 was the date when Warren Bishop took power in Grenada. Bishop was a regular visitor to this country. And Dr. Jago was in regular contact with him. And so when he took power in Grenada, the next day on March the 14th, I was on a small Leah plane after Grenada. So I ran there on the evening of the 14th. I had a letter with me from Chedi to Morris Bishop. And my task was to deliver that letter to Bishop, who had established his headquarters in Radio Free Grenada at the time. I took the letter to him, in fact, I was transported to him. Took the letter to him. He opened the letter and he read it in my presence. And the fundamental question in the letter was, what is the most urgent issue facing the revolution? Bishop eventually got on the phone and spoke to Dr. Jacques told him the most urgent issue or the most, most pressing issue facing me now, meaning Bishop now, is recognition. To get recognition of the new government. Because that was a problem. Nobody wanted to recognize a government that had taken power by the means by which Bishop had taken power. And so recognition was the challenge. And so, between Dr. Jagan and Michael Manley in Jamaica, Dr. Jagan made contact with his friends in Eastern Europe and Moscow, and Manley made contact with the Social Democratic parties in Western Europe. And in that way, Bishop was able to overcome the question of recognition. But as we knew, or as we know, even though he had won recognition, from the then socialist countries and USSR, it was still a challenge because as we saw with eventually with the invasion of Grenada, there were still powers in the Caribbean that did not accept his regime or the administration in Grenada. There are many other examples that I refer to in the book which were never really disclosed in public. I thought it was important. I felt it was important to say those things in this book. Things, for example, for example, about the Georgetown or what I was called upon to do. The mission that I was called upon to carry out on behalf of the People's Progressive Party in those days. Those are my experiences. And as Ralph said, those are my experiences, my interpretation, my understanding. And those things are recorded in this book. They're not recorded anywhere else. They could not be recorded anywhere else because in those days when it took place, I wouldn't say that it was secret mission, but they were not public missions. They were not made public. So if you read this book now, you will see many of those things have been referred to. So, we had the historic Congress of the People's Progressive Party at the Empire Cinema, which is about a landmark Congress. Rob was there, Dalo was there. I think a few other Congress in the audience were there. That is when the PPP made the decision to create what is called the PPP sitting, the alliance with Samuel Hines as the Prime Ministerial candidate. I recall when, and that's in the book, I recall when we had the decision in the leadership of the party 
where we had the discussion and the matter, the leadership of the party. How are we to present to the public PPP civic? And there were a lot of discussions on those issues. You know, Dr. John was a man who loved discussion, encouraged discussion. And so there were many ideas and suggestions about how to present this new concept in the public. And Janet Jarrett got up and said, look, we already have PPP, which is like the brand name Colgate Toothpaste. It's a household name. Why change that? Just add PPP slash Sydney. And there you have it. The household name called it to place with the new civic organization. And that's how it was presented in the public. Gain traction. Gain traction. So that's up to today, we still have the PPP civic running at elections and winning elections. We had the death of Mr. Borno just after our Congress. When Dr. Luncheon called me at Freedom House to say, Kabul Rohim, the big man just died in August 85. We had just finished a party conference. So I was the one to pass on that information to Dr. John. And of course, it was something totally new. In the same way as the victory in 1992 was totally new. For the people of Guyana, down of a new era. Victory in 1992. We had the, that's well documented, the election reforms, electoral reforms. Ralph North West was deep in it. We had the Carter Center people here. And by the way, I mentioned also in the book that prior to the elections, I was sent on another mission to Nicaragua to observe the elections in the Caracol. And it was there that I saw the presence of the Carter Center people observing the elections in the Caracol. And so I came back to Guyana and I shared that experience with the leadership of the party. One of the demands of the electoral reform was to have foreign observers observe the elections. Because previously, the administration were never allowing foreign observers or giving them or accrediting them to observe elections. And part of the reform was to allow foreign observers to come to Guyana. And so the Carter Center was contacted and through a number of intermediaries who were coming forward in those days, some of them are mentioned in the book, helped Dr. Jarrett to promote the PPP as the alternative to the government at the time was already crumbling. So we had a victory in 1992, the dawn of a new era. And that brought on a totally new dimension to Guyanese politics. Some people woke up like they couldn't believe that there's a new government in the country. But the new President Jagan had his own challenges. Debt relief, governance issues. Many people were demanding that he go after people who were claimed to be corrupt, who were, who were involved in corrupt activities. But he said, no, my task is to unite. And so we had the period which is recorded in the book when Dr. Jarrell continued his fight for debt relief, battles with the trade unions, and conversations, I should say, with the trade unions, border issues, it's constant, we're having many border issues as well. And the border issues was mainly to do with Venezuela. 
Many to do with ministry. And this is a constant irritant, so to speak, in Guyana's foreign policy. Which the country, irrespective of who's in the government, managed to address skillfully over the years. And that's where we are now, and respected the matter before the International Court of Justice. Hopefully, that what we re whatever we're expecting from the International Court of Justice will bring a large degree of closure to this controversy. But we know that the Venezuela will not recognize as it never recognized like in the South China Sea history, the jurisdiction of the International Tribunal. There were some interesting periods, for example, the transitions with the passage of Yon Chen Dai to Janda Jagan, Janda Jagan to Sam Hines, Sam Hines to Bar Jagbyo, and then Bar Jagbyo to Ramata all successive PPPC governments for a specific period of time. And through that period of time, a tremendous amount of attention was paid to the social sector. If you examine the budgetary allocations for every government that I refer to, there was a tremendous amount of emphasis on social sector, education, health, and so forth. Of course, security always a big issue in our country. How to deal with police issues, police reform, etc. So, the Ramatar period, the Jagdo period, was a very interesting period. What was interesting about this period was that neither Chelly, nor Janet, nor Sam at the time to address developmental issues uh, in the way they wanted to. So he didn't leave off his time, his term in office. Janet resigned without serving out of his office. Sam was a, a holy president, so to speak. Part of what was described as the 18. Donald, his presidency, was also shortened because of the minority government, budget cuts, etc., etc., and so forth. So we had all these difficulties during that period. This is the 1992 to 2015 period. So, we arrive at the stage in the book where I refer to the loss of government. This, of course, was not a very pleasant period for us, and especially for Donald, who was then the president. Could not have served off his entire period, tenure, or even present the chance of being reelected. Was a serious blow for the PPP, for the party. But. We enter into a period of fight back. Loss of government. And you hear about 10 years in the background. The back of our feet again. That the people. Got back on his feet again. And we saw during that period a number of interesting developments. For me, we had the Linden riots where I was accused of giving direction to the police to shoot protesters. I think it was Donald who was the president then was called upon to set up a commission of inquiry into this incident. A commission of inquiry was set up. Judge, 
was here with us was a member of that Commission of Inquiry, among others who came from overseas. And he deliberated and was questioned a number of people, I think over a period of two days. We have some very distinguished jurists from Jamaica, from Trinidad, from Guyana. Our present chairman of GCOP was a member of the commission. I thought it was a very distinguished panel that the government managed to put together. In the same way, they put together a very distinguished panel for the Rodney Inquiry, into the Inquiry of the Rodney So the governance issue, when it comes to matters like that, has always been very outstanding. And so, the Commission of Inquiry made their ruling public, which cleared me of very wrong doing, which I knew I wasn't guilty of, because I never gave instructions to the police. I wouldn't. You see, I learned a lot from Janet's experience as Minister for Home Affairs in the 57 to 64 government. I read about how she dealt with that period, the challenges she faced, and what led her to resign as the Minister of Affairs at the time. And the comments who made the point about the historical records is important because if I had not read what she had experienced, I probably would not have been able to deal and to gain certain insights as to how to deal with the police as Minister of Home Affairs. And so I knew that with the police in Linden, it would have been rather foolhardy for me on a telephone to be giving operational instructions to the commander who was up there. Not possible. And so there was no way that I could have been uh, deemed guilty for such a thing. And then there was also the question of parliament, where I was prevented from speaking in the parliament. I couldn't speak. The matter went to court. The present Attorney General did a fantastic job in defending me. One time they were even plotting to prevent me from entering Parliament buildings. But you know, the institution, the separation of the two uh, institutions of state, Parliament, Court, and Executive, I think is functioning well in this country, notwithstanding some of the difficulties we have from time to time. Court decisions, decisions in the National Assembly, some of the decisions by the executive sometimes clash with what Parliament should be doing and what the court should be doing. But eventually these institutions, as we could see, assert themselves and we get justice in so many ways. A good example of this is what happened soon after the no confidence motion. The no confidence motion. The court battles going right up to the Caribbean Court of Justice, coming all the way back to the lower courts. We all have fresh in our memories the whole question of the attempts to rig the election, the involvement of the ABCP, ABC and E countries in the electoral process, carrying common role in the electoral process. I don't need to regale you with the details. Some of it is referred to in the book, my story, myself. But then, August of 2019 came, 
and we're back at the ground there. There's a sound I love very much that reflects. Must get the back of the ground there. And you're hearing some of it in the background. Many people step forward. Many step forward to demand respect for free fair elections. And so we follow the story. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new government in office, I hear now, in the capacity to, as a government representative, not to speak on behalf of the government. But unlike the past, the dollar reform to Bennett was integrally involved in every major decision of the People's Progressive Party and of the government. I'm not, no, I don't understand that. And I'm watching on. But as citizen Rohi, and with politics in my DNA, as they say, I think I'm competent enough to interpret political development as it takes place in our country and to see things in proper perspective. And so we have now the prospects of the oil economy, what it will bring to the people what it ought to bring to people, the back and forth be based on whether it's good or bad, whether we will be suffering the oil course or whatever. All of this is taking place in a democracy, and that's the beauty of a democracy. All these debates are helping people to understand. Some may be prejudiced, some may be not helpful, some may be too critical. But in my own view, and my some call my want to call me a liberal democrat in this sense. I believe in the free press. And I believe that all these ideas that are going backwards and forwards and whatever it might be, they help people to understand. Now, Christ said that there's a percentage of people that don't read in this country. That might very well be true. And that's the reason why I didn't bring a box load of these books here. I knew that, and that's why the books are being sold. Whoever can purchase them on Amazon.com, whoever wants to purchase a Kindle version, or whoever wants to go to an international book fair, they're available. No point in bringing a cart you know, you know, the of these books here. Who's going to buy them? They're being sold in US dollars, and if you to convert the US dollars, they're being sold in the other dollars. I'm sure if you go and talk to Mr. Austin at Austin before you might tell you Mr. Rowan, I'm not so sure how many of these I can take. So that's the price you have to pay for publishing. But at the same time, like every challenge, there's an opportunity. And the opportunity is to have them sold on Amazon, Kindle, book fairs, etc., etc. And that's what I mean. So we're looking ahead now what is the future for our country? A booming economy, greater or increased uh, disposal, financial disposal, people are able to do different things apart from the basics. I am very optimistic about the future for my country then. I'm very optimistic. I'm happy to hear that school will be reopened in September. Because every time I think about the thousands and maybe millions of children around the world who can't go to school, who've been out of school for almost a year now, it's not fair. But then, help comes to us. So, we're coming to the end of my talk about this book. And I like what Stevie Wonder says, and I like what 
another singer said, called Lou Robbins. Somebody mentioned the back of the book, what they said in the back of the book. I didn't read any excerpt from the book because I think it's important for you to see for yourself. I make reference to the hectic problem we have in our country. And I say that I wish I could do more in joining with others to break the deep ethnic and political divide that so menacingly threatened the boards of some the social fabric of our fragile democracy. But the age old problem seems to be deeply embedded in the value of national society. And that is why it will take years of hard work before it shows signs of its beginning to gradually wither away. Perhaps it will be next, it will be the next generation to whom the responsibility will fall to heal the wounds and lift Guyana onward upwards. Therein lies my optimistic view of this country's future. I want to regale you with the details of this book simply to say that this is a companion, a companion to my story myself. Because what I did not elaborate on in this book is elaborated on in this compendium of articles, which originally were letters to the editors of this type of words and the title. So this is a more expanded version of some of the uh, issues that I refer to in this book. And like I said, while I was writing this, I was writing for this as well. But it was fun. Writing for me is fun. And so I wish to encourage you to... These are available here. This was published in Guyana. This is published here, and this major two published in this case. So there's a place in the sun, and the sun is for all of us. I believe so. We have many friends. Guyana, this country has a lot of friends. One of them, the representative one is sitting in this audience here. And I would want to close by saying this, that the views expressed in this book are those of Clement Rue. I was told once by a learned individual that when you write and put your views out in public, you must be prepared to be judged. Because it's on the basis of what you write people judge you. Although people are not to judge you, that ought to be left to someone else. But humans are humans are. And I was prepared and had the courage to put this on. I am prepared to face the criticisms. I am prepared to face the what you call it attacks or whatever one I wrote here. But at the end of the day, fortunately, we live in a democracy where there's freedom of thought, freedom of expression. And it's in that context, I have made this contribution to the Guyanese people and the world at large. Thank you very much.
Mr. Rogi and his family, to thank you very much for the support you showed today. And to spend this time with him at this significant event. And I want to thank you to either get a copy today or to ensure that you do so this evening on Amazon. Like you said, it's going to be a pretty empty read. But um, his perspective on a number of valuable and significant issues in our history is critical at this time. So thank you very much. And I invite you now to come to the whole table. Thank you. And do have a very good evening. Thank you. 